on the island of Newfoundland, upon the Selwyn's coast, lies the little town of Virgil, to whom all things is told. There are so many islands that lie just off her shores, and when the cold north wind blows, you can hear. They have lost some loved ones to the furies of the sea for heartaches and heartbreaks are locked in memory. This village has got beauty carved on its rugged shore. Seven miles of pure white sand. Who could ask for more? The mountains and the valleys, where the rivers run so fast, and the salmon rise to the sportsman's fly as he makes another cast. Tell the people of this village, love their native home. Anyone who goes away Oh, surely will return Just like that lifelong mystery The answer you won't know What makes this rugged village burn So deeply in your soul What makes this rugged belly burn so deeply in your soul. Good evening and welcome to this week in review. Tonight in our stories we have Fire Prevention Week, Portraits of Honor, Naming of the Playground, MP Judy Foote. Please stay tuned for these stories after this. Try your luck on Wednesday and play TV Bingo, sponsored by the Guiding Movement. Cards are 6 for $5 and can be bought from any member of the Girl Guides or in most stores around town. Last week was Fire Prevention Week. The fire department added the school students over doing some fire safety drills. This particular time, the firemen were showing fat fires. <laughs> Cooking, cooking oil. Cooking oil, same. oil or vegetable oil. French fries. I don't want to go. She's gone. Okay, buddy, you're going to see what happens. See, all your smoke is gone now, right? So, what Victoria you do? You put uh... The Portraits of Honor trailer came into town on Tuesday. It began with a motorcade near Seabrook, with the cadets and rangers joining them near the arena. After the motorcade, the trailer didn't park near the Bell Alliance building and the Portraits of Honor was revealed. A supper was ill shortly after in the fire off for invited guests. Tours were ill throughout the evening and the next morning. Many people came by to view the painting and to pay respect to our fallen soldiers 
especially Sergeant Von Ingram. On the website www.portraitsofhonor.ca, a write-up can be viewed along with a few pictures. Here is what the write-up said. Throughout the tour, we have often spoken about fallen arrows, referring to 157 soldiers, sailors, and aircrew on the Portraits of Honor's mural as figures of honors, examples of patriotism, and champions of the abused and oppressed. Those depicted on the mural are all of these things, certainly, but they were also people just like you and I. They have a past illustrated clearly when medals and certificates and mementos belonging to Virgil's fallen Sergeant Von Ingram were displayed and explained to a crowd gathered at a fundraising dinner in support of the Portraits of Honor. Looking at physical pieces of the young man's military history and speaking with his family, one began to get a true sense of the type of person he had been in life. And despite the fact they are no longer with us physically, in Virgil it became clear that Sergeant Ingram and his comrades have a presence as well as a past. Hundreds of residents came to help create a parade more than two kilometers long through the town to honor their memory. With so much love, support, and energy pouring forth, it was impossible to believe that Sergeant Ingram's spirit does not live on in those who knew him well, as the memory of so many others have in the communities we have visited across the nation. It seems that heroes like Vaughn even have a future. As a part of the portraits of our tour stop in Burgio, a ceremony was held dedicating a park to Sergeant Ingram. A sign stands outside the park features a large picture of Ingram so that all who visit the park will see the young man who, like them, played in the parks of their community and went on to do great things. In this way, the fallen friend lives on. The next morning, a ceremony was held at the playground as it was named after our fallen soldier, Sergeant Von Ingram. A sign depicting Sergeant Ingram's picture and two chairs were dedicated in his memory. The majority of the community along with all those in school, came out for the occasion. Now that the sign has been revealed, uh, I'd like to uh, spend, it a, spend it a special thanks uh, to uh, Dean Sims Anderson. MP Judy Foote, who came to be a part of the motorcade, came into the studio to have a chat Tonight with us. Tonight in our studio, I have with me our MP Judy Foote. Good evening. Good evening to you. And welcome back to our studio. It's always good to be here with you. Thanks. Uh, so what brings you our way today? Well, I heard some time ago about the uh, Veterans Traveling Exhibit, and I didn't get all the detail of it, so my office has been trying to, to find out exactly uh, when it was coming to Newfoundland mm -hmm. and where it was coming to Newfoundland. And um, I guess uh, Gord Ingram was on the Open Line show yesterday, okay. and uh, my office heard him and, of course, let me know, and I said, well, let's see how I can be there. I've always made a point of going to wherever veterans are. You know, I, I just respect them so much and for the service that they do. Uh, that when they found out that it was going to be here in Burgio and that uh, it was uh, Sergeant Vaughn Ingram who was actually part of the portrait uh, mural that's uh, of our fallen heroes, then uh, we had to figure out a way of, of uh, making sure that I could be here for that. Mm -hmm. I happened to be on my way to Port of Basque okay. uh, for a dinner to uh, um, pay tribute to uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Taylor, who's retiring after 44 years of medical service, mm -hmm. 34 years, by the way, in Port of Basque. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, he's, he's an icon uh, out that way, and it was important uh, for me to go out and be part of the celebration. So this was really uh, an opportune time. It worked out really well that uh, I could come to Burgio on the way and then go on to Port of Basque. Okay, perfect. So any uh, topics you want to discuss while you're here with me today? I do, but uh, let me just say how good it is to be here. Oh. And I'm really looking forward to... Uh, 
to being part of the motorcade. Uh, I can't stay for the reception and the meet and greet, but I will get to spend some time with, with Vaughn's parents. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to be able to express my appreciation as a member of Parliament and as a Canadian uh, for uh, Vaughn's, um, you know, years of service mm -hmm. on behalf of, of the Canadian people and, uh, and the respect in which he is held, not only among the people of Burgio, but the entire province and the entire country, mm. because we do respect our veterans so much. And it's yes. just really unfortunate that, of course, he's no longer with us. Yes, exactly. But uh, we can never forget him mm. or his service. Mm. I've, uh, I've just come from Ottawa, just that very minute, landed in, in, uh, in Deer Lake and, and, and managed to get here to Burgio. But uh, it's, it's a busy time in Ottawa, and I'm, I'm back doing what I do best, and that is representing the people of Randon Beer in St. George's. Mm. We're now faced with a minority government, you know, mm -hmm. Stephen Harper has a, a majority government, let me rephrase that, a majority government. Stephen Harper now has a majority. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, all the comments that were made to me during the election, the federal election, you know, about how fearful people were mm -hmm. about what he would do if he formed a majority are in fact coming true. Okay. We're seeing cuts everywhere we look. Instead of having a focus on jobs, 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 because we know when people are gainfully employed, they pay taxes. Mm -hmm. That helps keep the economy going. We know when people are employed, they're healthier. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need the same degree of medical attention because, you know, they don't get depressed and they don't, uh, you know, get sick as, as readily as when, as when they're worried about whether or not they have employment. Um, but here we have a Prime Minister whose entire focus is on cuts. Uh, he ran up a $56 billion deficit, mm -hmm. you know, spent like a uh, crazy, you know, building things like fake lighthouses and fake lakes and uh, buying foolishness for a G8 summit, you know, uh, spent $50 million in one minister's riding alone out of what's called the Border Infrastructure Fund. Uh, and this minister's riding was nowhere near a border. Mm -hmm. So it was total abuse of, of spending of money for which it was not intended. And now he's turning around and he's going to cut the legs out from under Canadians just to try and deal with the deficit. Yes. Well, he created the deficit and here we are now looking. Let's take, for example, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And you and I were talking about this earlier. Yes. You know, the cuts that are coming down the, the pipe to that particular department that's so important to a province like Newfoundland and Labrador and so important to a riding like ours in Random Bureau in St. George's, which is primarily uh, a fishing focused uh, riding. When you yes. consider that we have 180 communities uh, spread along the coastline, you know, and uh, any suggestion at all of cuts that are going to impact on the fishery is devastating for us. Yes, exactly. And I, I'm really concerned. I, and at this point, of course, what they announced first was like, uh, you know, in three years we're going to see maybe uh, close to $85 million cut from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. No specifics, not saying where the cuts were coming. And now all of a sudden, day by day, they're dropping a little bit more and letting us know, well, this is being cut, that's being cut. For instance, you know, the uh, Federal Fisheries Conservation Council. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know what happened with our cod fishery. Mm -hmm. You know the moratorium on the cod fishery. We know the fishery is not rebounding, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as quickly as we would like it to, the cod fishery that is. And uh, science is really important here. Mm -hmm. And not only is the science uh, important, like the scientists themselves and people with, you know, with different areas of expertise, but the fishermen are so important. Mm -hmm. And that council, depended on the fishers to let them know what was happening out on the ocean, you know, what they were catching, the size of the catch, the abundance of the catch, uh, you know, and, and that was so important in formulating policy and trying to determine what's going on in the fishery. Well, Stephen Harper decided to cut that council. And the language they're using is that we are going to simplify the science. Well, for me, that says, Simplify the science means you're just going to get rid of the science. Mm -hmm. you, you don't believe in science, you know. Decisions should be made on fact. They should be based on fact. And if you're making a decision on a go-forward basis, it should be because you've done your research and you know exactly what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Not this government. They're just cutting for the sake of cutting. And they say, you know, they're putting more money into science. Well, they're not putting more money into science. In fact, they're muzzling scientists. 
And that's a very serious issue for us. Anyone who's concerned about the fishery, the fact that they would just arbitrarily cut this council, whose whole reason for being is to evaluate what is happening in our fishery and try and work with that to see that the fishery rebounds in a way that's going to be good. It's a renewable industry. It's not like oil. You know, oil is going to be depleted. This is the fishery that, we've, that we have depended on ever since our, we existed. Mm -hmm. And now what we're seeing is that there's, like, the fishery just seems to be a dirty word. I said yesterday to the minister, I stood in the House of Commons yesterday, and I put a question to uh, Keith Ashfield, who happens to be from New Brunswick, who happens to be a nice man, but he's the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans, and obviously, um, I'm not sure if he knows what he's talking about or if he's just being fed a line by the bureaucrats and if he's not standing up to the bureaucrats or if he's just doing what uh, Prime Minister Harper's telling him to do. Because when I asked the question of the, uh, of the minister yesterday and I said to him, you know, you say that you believe in science, but you're cutting this council that is scientifically based and that depends on the input of fishers. But you can't have it both ways. You can't speak out of both sides of your mouth mm and retain your credibility, no, it's you know? Yeah. And I'm saying to him, why don't you stop gutting the department? Because in gutting the department, you're going to destroy the fishery. Yes. You should live up to your responsibility as a government and support the fishing industry, not destroy it. And you always get the same pat answer back. You know, oh, we're doing everything we can. Uh, you know, we're supporting the fishery. When in reality, their actions speak otherwise. Yes. I'm, I'm concerned when they talk about cutting the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, funding for small craft harbors comes from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Okay. So you know in our riding, a random beer in St. George's, we probably have more small craft harbors than any other riding in the country. Yes. Any suggestion of any cutbacks to the budget for small craft harbors is going to be devastating. I mean, that's what we depend on in our small fishing communities to maintain the infrastructure from which the fishermen fish. Exactly. We need to have safe wharves. Mm -hmm. We need to have safe infrastructure from which they can earn their livelihood. And any thought at all that you might cut um, the budget of small craft harbors is a scary thought. Mm -hmm. We don't know. At this point, they are not being specific. It was only, as I said, it was a leaked memo, by the way, a leaked memo from someone in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to some people that spelled out some of the cuts that DFO was making. And that's how come we knew about it. It wasn't because the government announced we're cutting this. It was because of a leaked memo by somebody within the department who thought we should know that this is what the Harper government is doing. And there's a lot of that happening, by the way. You look at the um, Marine or the Maritime Rescue Subcenter in St. John's, okay? They're closing that. Yes. I mean, that is so important to the safety of anyone who travels on the water, yes, exactly. especially our fishers. Mm -hmm. Or if you're on an um, ocean going vessel, you're, you're, you know, you're in some kind of trade. Uh, you know, uh, if you're a tourist, you're out there on, on the ferries. You know, if you're going, for instance, uh, between Newfoundland and Labrador and St. Pierre Miquelon, you know, the ferry service there. If you're going back and forth, if you're going from Burgio to Ramia, you know, um, search and rescue is so important. Yes. And they're cutting, they're closing down that center in St. John's. And they're moving the service to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and to Trenton, Ontario. And the people that work in that center in St. John's, there are 12 of them. And they say they're not moving. I mean, what's the point? They have their homes, they have their lives in Newfoundland and Labrador. You can't expect them to uproot and move to Nova Scotia or move to Trenton. Yes. Some of them may have no choice. But the reality is, is that the service that's being provided through that rescue center in St. John's will no longer be available in Newfoundland and Labrador. And you know and I know that the oceans in which we travel on which we travel and that our fishermen make a livelihood from are treacherous. Yes, exactly. And when they go out there to try and earn a living, the last thing they need to have on their mind is whether or not if they get in trouble, there's going to be anyone there to respond immediately to the tragedy. Mm -hmm. And right now, when that center closes, if an SOS goes out, it's going to be picked up by someone in either Nova Scotia or in Ontario. 
Now, I know and you know, and I've heard those who work at the center in St. John say to me that you really need that local knowledge of Newfoundland and Labrador coastline no, yes, to be sure. effective, right? I mean, if you've got someone out in a boat and they're taken on water and they're trying to relay a message to search and rescue at the same time that they're probably trying to save their own lives, you know, as well. Well, they're not going to take the time and be really articulate about, you know, where they are and, and you know, they're going to to say, you know, I, I'm in a name that's familiar to anyone in Newfoundland and Labrador. And the person in the Search and Rescue Center in St. John's knows exactly what they're talking about. Yes. You know, and they know exactly where to send the Search and Rescue vehicles yes. or the vessels or the helicopter, you know, whatever is going to be sent to try and, 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 uh, and rescue uh, those in trouble. But try telling someone in Nova Scotia or someone in Ontario where you are and having to take the time and explain the latitude and the longitude and you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so we're fighting this. We're fighting this closure. We're not getting a lot of help in fighting that closure. We're not getting enough people speaking out about it. You know, I'm on my feet in the House of Commons. I'm on the open line shows. You know, there are petitions that are being collected. We had a rally downtown St. John's where you had, uh, you know, a lot of people involved. But where's the provincial government? Mm -hmm. Like, where's Premier Dunderdale on this? We're not hearing the outcry that we need to hear from the Premier to her friend Stephen Harper. She says she has a good working relationship with him. Well, please implore on this man who has no understanding or doesn't care about what's going on here, implore on him that this just can't happen. Mm -hmm. It can't happen uh, because it means the safety of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians in particular but everyone who travels on our coastline and, and, you know, in the ocean. I mean, as it is, what's really concerning to me is that they're saying that uh, they're not going to enhance search and rescue. Right now we have three Cormorant helicopters that covers um, our ocean, which works out to be about a land mass the size of Europe. Three Cormorant helicopters. And that's really scary. So when you hear things like that, you start to wonder, um, who's making these decisions? Who's advising who? And why is it that we're not more involved as a province mm -hmm. in getting our message across to the federal government? Because, you know, at one point, there wasn't a working relationship there. So you could point to that and say, well, Harper's just ignoring us mm -hmm. because, you know, um, the premier of the day, who happened to be Danny Williams, uh, had no time for him. Well, the premier of today... Kathy Dunderdale has time for him. They have a working relationship. So why isn't Premier Dunderdale making it very clear to Prime Minister Harper that this can happen, so that that center will not close, that search and rescue won't be put at risk? Because right now, if that center closes as it's intended to close, then people's lives will be at risk. And we talk about leaked memos. A leaked memo that came to me, uh, the Search and Rescue Center in St. John's is supposed to close in June of next year. The Search and Rescue Center in Quebec is supposed to close at the same time. And the services coming from both out of Nova Scotia and Ontario. Well, this leaked memo made it very clear that yes, the closing date for the Search and Rescue Center in St. John's is scheduled for June 12th and will happen June 12th. However, the closure of the Search and Rescue Center in Quebec will not happen then because there's an issue around French language and they don't have sufficient employees with uh, skilled uh, in the French language. So it's going to take a bit longer. They weren't specific about how much longer. So, of course, I raised this. You know, um, in fact, in the memo, what was very explicit was that they will close the center in St. John's they will use that as a template later to close the center in Quebec. So, of course, I started to go, okay, wait now. So, is what's going to happen here is that the one in St. John's will close, but the one in Quebec won't close? So, I raised that in the House of Commons in question period. And the response back was, you know, that's not true. Both centers are going to close at the date they're intended to close. But we're being told through this leaked memo by the very people who have responsibility for closing down those centers 
and getting the other two up to scratch to be able to handle the additional services, that there's no way they will be ready to do that by June. So this is going to happen, and they're going to just go full steam ahead with it, even though they're not going to be ready, which again concerns me when it comes to search and rescue. So these are serious issues. Yes. You know, and, and you know, Maxine, that, you know, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians don't need any more drama when it comes to the ocean. No, for sure. You know, so many lives have been yes. lost as it is. Enough tragedy. You know, enough tragedy. Mm -hmm. And if and seconds means lives. You know, if you cannot get a response to, you know, where there's a tragedy occurring within a matter of seconds, then it could very well mean the loss of a life. So you know that, I know that, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians know that. But somehow the people who are in the position to make the decision about this are just going full steam ahead and ignoring all of that. And then you've got things happening like, you know, we're dealing with the budget, the federal budget now. And they're bringing the budget down. And normally you have, you know, weeks to discuss the budget yes. and debate the budget and the merits of the budget or the non-merits of the budget. And lo and behold, we had only discussed the budget for two days. And that's not two full days. Like that's maybe four hours, six hours. And the government introduced closure. What that meant was they were limiting the amount of time that the opposition, both the NDP and the Liberals, could discuss the budget. They want to just get it over with just like that. And one of the things they're doing is they're implementing a payroll tax on small and medium-sized businesses. Now, small and medium-sized businesses are the lifeblood of rural communities in particular. Yes. They're the employers. They're where most people work. Mm -hmm. And by introducing a payroll tax, it's just going to be more of a burden on those employers. So instead of hiring more people, they're not going to hire more people because the more people they hire, the more they're going to have to pay in payroll tax. Yes. At the same time, Stephen Harper is turning around and giving tax breaks to the tune of $6 million a year to large businesses. So the large corporations are getting a tax break while the small, medium enterprises are being taxed further with the payroll tax, additional payroll taxes. So it's, what's going on is, is, you know, I would say criminal. Mm. I would, because it's, it's just, there's no um, way, shape, or form that you can convince them that this is the wrong thing to do. Uh, they're full steam ahead with their uh, omnibus crime bill, which we debated, and showed them the, what was so wrong about that bill. They're building mega prisons. Now, I don't know if you happened to see the CBC program that was on the other night, but it talked about the situation in Texas, how that was exactly what they did in Texas, and they did it in California too, by the way. They built mega prisons. And it didn't matter if it was a, you know, a, a teenager who made a mistake, thrown in prison, right? There's no such thing as money being put into preventive programs, especially to help young people who make mistakes yes. and who really can turn their lives around. Um, in the U.S., in, in, in this program the other night on CBC, it talked about the situation in Texas. And what they found was it didn't work. You cannot throw people in prison and expect them to re be rehabilitated. You cannot throw first-time offenders in with hardened criminals and expect them to come out not being a hardened criminal because no, exactly. they will learn from the best while they're in there. Yes. You know, and you know when you're put in that situation, you either have to go along with the hardened criminals or you know what your fate is going to be. Yeah. You know, it's, not, it's not pretty. You talk to anyone who spent time in jail and people who've come out and have been in the John Howard, you know, society homes and things, and they will tell you it's not nice. So instead, what they're doing in the U.S. is that they're moving away from mega prisons. In fact, they're closing down these mega prisons because they have found that the more money you spend on prevention, the more time you give to working with people and uh, explaining to them the error of their ways, you know. I'm not talking about murderers here. Mm. You know, I'm talking about, you know, petty theft, 
you know. I'm talking about maybe uh, a break-in, you know. Uh, I'm talking about a, a teenager who's, uh, you know, stealing something, you know, and, and but who's being, instead of just being, you know, put into a program, uh, you know, where they will, uh, you know, understand what they did was wrong yeah. and, and, and know that they can never go down that path again. They're being thrown in jail. Mm. And you tell this time and time again to the Harper government, to the Minister of Justice, and it's full steam ahead spending billions, billions of dollars on mega prisons. What we couldn't do with that money? Yes. There are so many people living in poverty. Mm -hmm. There are so many single parents out there who don't know where to turn. There are so many seniors who need help. Pensions, you know, for retired civil servants and others that have never seen an increase. Mm -hmm. There are those engaged in the fishery who really need to be able to access an early retirement package. There are small business uh, people who need a handout sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, um, to help with their business when times are difficult. But instead, this money, your money, my money, the money that belongs to the people of Burgio, mm -hmm being spent on doing things that are totally irresponsible, whether it's mega prisons, whether it's uh, wasting $50 million in one minister's riding to do things that it was most inappropriate to do, uh, giving um, salary increases to their political support staff. Before the last federal election, the prime minister um, increased the salaries of the political staff in his office. In fact, one employee alone got an increase of $35,000. Now, that's not right. No. That's not right. And those are the kinds of things that are happening in Ottawa. And that's what we're fighting. But you know, I'll stand, and you know me, I'll, I'll fight for <laughs> as long as I can fight. Uh, but we really need, when it comes to Newfoundland and Labrador, when it comes to the fishery in particular, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm pleading I'm pleading with the province to get involved, to speak out on this issue, to, to try and persuade using your powers of persuasion uh, with this newfound relationship you now have with Mr. Harper to make the point that you cannot get away with this, that we're not going to sit back and let you do this uh, to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans because that's going to have devastating consequences in Newfoundland and Labrador. So, you know, the louder we are, the better. Uh, you know, I continue to present petitions. We won our fight for those fishers who had been uh, robbed of money when they were asked to pay 100% uh, capital gains tax when they sold their license that time. Working with Elizabeth Harvey, you know, uh, down in Isla Mort, and Eli Baker, who was the lawyer, and there were 750 that he, it was a class action suit, and Levi, Eli Baker took it to court, and after 11 years, won. And those fishers, unfortunately, some of them have since passed away, but their estates will be given back the money that was, uh, was taken from them. You know, it, it was put into a federal treasury when it was their money, so wrong. And there are still thousands out there who now, you know, I'm hoping Eli will take on their cases as well. Mm -hmm. But you've got to fight. You've got to keep fighting. And that's an example of how if you fight, you can win. Yes, exactly. It seems like the Arthur government wants to wipe Newfoundland off. You know what's really scary? Mm -hmm. Is that the only focus, the only sense you get from Stephen Harper is that, you know, the only thing that matters is the West, mm. you know? So Alberta and, you know, the Western provinces. Um, he's concerned about Quebec, clearly. Mm. But when it comes to Newfoundland and Labrador, and he tends to forget, and I've always said, you know, when I was elected either, you know, member of the House of Assembly provincially, or now the member of Parliament federally, I, I wasn't supported by 100% of the voters, but once I was elected, I represented all of those voters. It doesn't matter how they voted. Yes. I'm the Member of Parliament for everyone in Random Beer and St. George's. Mm. The Prime Minister of Canada 
is the Prime Minister of every Canadian, not just those who voted for Conservative members of Parliament. And unfortunately, that is, I think, the attitude we're dealing with. Yes. His, he's more inclined to penalize than to understand that there are always going to be differences of opinion and that he doesn't have all the answers. And that's what we're dealing with in Ottawa. We're dealing with a government that thinks it has all the answers and that no one else has any contribution to make. Oh, very good, that's that good. So anyways, I'd like to thank you for uh, dropping by and having this chat with us. Well, it, it's always a pleasure to be here. I always appreciate the time that I get that I can speak to the people of, of Burjo and anyone else who's able to, uh, to avail of your uh, broadcasting services. This is such a wonderful facility, a wonderful opportunity, and uh, every time I'm coming to Burjo or if I'm going over to Ramya, I always call ahead to say, see if Maxine can accommodate me, because I really do enjoy the time that we get to spend together. Well, it's always nice chatting with you. This you. concludes our program for tonight. Thank you for watching. Good night.